Hello friends and listener, welcome to the new episode of the Naked Soul Talk Show and I have a very special guest today, Simone Salmon. She is an author, a spiritual seeker and also uh, someone who is currently working uh, as her hands stepped in the corporate America and she is Jamaican born New Yorker so we have a lot of uh, interesting story <laughs> to hear today uh, about her journey, the book that she has recently published. Welcome, Simone. Welcome to The Naked Soul. Thank you so much, Salil. I am so honored to be on your show today. Thank you so much for asking me, for reaching out. You know, this is really, really special for me. So thank you. Well, uh, I'm honored that you are here. And that's one of the, uh, I think, the benefit of social media. So I, yes. we got connected on Twitter. And honestly speaking, I have never taken Twitter seriously up until maybe two months back. So, oh my goodness, you're not going to believe it. I did. It's the same thing same for thing. me. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly two months. No kidding. Believe me, I mean, I've been on Twitter since 2010, and it's 2015, so it's been five years. <laughs> and I've never figured it out that how can I, I mean, in, in terms of return on investment, that if I spend my time on Twitter, am I really connecting with people with whom I want to connect? Because they're, I mean, and it, yeah, so leave it. But you'd be very surprised because now that I actually know how to use Twitter, because I got on in 2013 mm -hmm. when I had my um, spiritual mind fest, my miracle mind fest uh, webinars, and I had no idea what I was doing. But recently I learned how to use Twitter to my benefit about two months ago. Wow. And yes, you will connect. You know, usually what happens when you're on the spiritual path is you're going to connect to the people that are meant to be in your circle anyway. Very and true. so the, and the people that actually have been connecting with me are on the spiritual path. Yeah, there's some who aren't, you know, they're doing their thing artistically, whatever. But the majority of people that are, that are coming into my Twitter account, uh -huh. you know, connecting with me are people on the spiritual path. And that's true. I think that's uh, one way... Uh based on your bio or the kind of work, or I think even the vibe and the aura that you project, yes. you can filter out the people uh, that you do not want in your circle. Definitely. And you invite the people whom you want in your circle. Exactly. So I think that's great. L let me first ask you this question. When people ask you that, what do you do? What is your long answer and the short answer to that question? Because since you're a writer, a creative, and you also have a full-time job, and you are a mother, and you have a family, and you have a journey. There's just so much. And it's a common yes. dilemma for all the artists, those who are not a full-time uh, into their creative art. It's a challenging question. What do you say? So, so tell us about what is your answer to that question? You know, that is a very interesting question. And um, I think, for the most part, it depends on who it is that's asking the question for me. So if, if it's someone in the corporate arena, if I'm going on the train and it's someone that I don't know and I can see they're in a business suit and you know they're really not, I can sense their energy and figure out what it is or where they're coming from, I'm going to tell them I'm a manager, right? I'm going to give them my business card, I'm a manager. But if it's someone that um, has been introduced to me and knows of my background and knows you know that I'm on a spiritual journey, I'm going to let them know that, yes, I'm an author. I also am a psychic medium, um, you know, I am on a spiritual journey. So I think it's dependent on the actual individual that is interacting with me. You know, I'm, I'm just now becoming comfortable even saying that I'm an author. Once I got the, the actual physical product in my hand, I realized me, that I it was actually that. real. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> so that's, that's new for me. But it, I think my, the most comfortable answer for me would, because I'm still in the corporate environment, is I'm a manager. And which yeah. is true. And, and, and you are contributing your time. Time is the most precious resource yes. that you have. And you're investing your time and energy and your creative will into that. So, so that is uh, important because I have a full-time job as well. And, and I really like, liked your answer that you do not have a cookie cutter answer or like a fixed script. Mm -hmm. But you try to connect with the people. So if someone is coming from a corporate background, you want to connect with them as exactly. an individual and tell them uh, 
something which they can understand and uh, relate to. Yeah, yeah, I really like that. And and the reason I ask this question uh, to all my guests is because, I mean, and correct me if I am uh, wrong or if you have a different uh, uh, feeling towards it, but even though, so I'm very much like you. So if I'm meeting someone from a business background, I will try to tell them something about what I do and from from mm-hmm. the perspective of business and corporate America. But if I'm meeting someone who is an artist or someone I know that who doesn't care about uh, what exactly I'm doing, how fine <laughs> what I really do. <laughs> yeah. So so I will talk more about from my creative pursuit and what my yes. passions are. But and I know that it's kind of there is a reason and there is a purpose why I do that. But nevertheless, I will always have this. Hmm, oh, I wish I had a simple two yeah. sentence or two line long some answer which I can tell to people what do I do and I wish I was a full time author or maybe a full time creative <laughs> so it's, and it's sometimes simple. I feel guilty sometimes I feel right. guilty because I'm really not honoring that creative part of me that that's really the true part of me mm-hmm. you know that because creativity and creative energy are like the for me it, they're such mystical and spiritual experiences and mm-hmm. that is really your connection to what life is about. And so for me, I feel really guilty when I don't answer, I'm an artist, I'm, I'm an author. you know. And so I'm working toward that as my main answer. Uh-huh. You know, I am an author, period. <laughs> and and, and you, you will be there. I, I'm to- I totally trust that because once you have set your intention clear yes. in the universe, you will be there. So, so, but anyway, so, so that's a great answer. And uh, do you have a long answer? Like if you are going to a conference or if, if, if you're talking to someone who is a friend, a relative whom you have not met in let's say five years, 10 years, and if they ask you, so, so Simone, what is going on? Uh, what are you doing? Or so how, how do you answer that? Well, I guess, you know, it, it would be, you know, right now what I am doing is I'm working um, – I'm working day to day, existing and living a nine to five job. However, my journey is more on a creative um, path, and I'm I'm also doing that in the meantime. So I'm whether it's painting or I'm connecting with um, you know people and giving them readings, spiritual readings, or even healings, and also working artistically on my book and painting. So it's it's going to be it's still going to be a com- combination of both, but I guess a little bit more descriptive as to what it is that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Very nice. And uh, so so that brings me uh, because you have just uh, said so many things that <laughs> where you're investing your energy. How do you how do you because you have a family uh, to take yeah. care of? How do you manage your time are you uh, the sort of creative type that when a project comes your way you spend your energy and time into it with uh, at most focus and then move on to the second thing and you have like five projects going on parallelly or are you the kind where you exercise time management or some sort of uh, management skill where you have three things that you're going to focus and you're going to spend 20 minutes on each one of them every day. So, so what is your creative process uh, in regards to your spiritual reading, writing, mm-hmm. family, job, and other creative pursuits that you are currently doing? Okay, so the first, the, my first response would be that I am not a time-conscious person because time for me is a man-made structure. Mm-hmm. It's a man-made concept. Um, and if you live within the limits of this man-made construct, then you're constantly trying to manage your time and looking at time. Mm -hmm. I find that, um, it's, it's easier for me to understand that life is really timeless. There is no no absolute when it comes to time because time goes on. Mm -hmm. Time is endless. And, um, you know, if you get caught up in doing something that you're really passionate about, you'll notice that the time does not exist. You're not thinking about the time. Exactly. So you're in time, that flow state. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So time is really, it, for me, it doesn't exist. And I don't look at it the way I guess other people look at it. Because of that, I'm able to do a lot of things at the same time. 
Um, and I guess that's also because of my corporate skill sets, because you have to multitask in that particular environment when you're in, especially when you're manager, you have to be able to multitask. Mm -hmm. And so thankfully I'm able to do, and so I could be writing my book, but mm -hmm. also um, creating a website or, um, you know, managing people in the field. I do, do them all at the same time. I don't have, I, I can honestly say that I do not have any type of like defined regimen mm -hmm. that I go after. It, it really doesn't happen for me. I don't sit and set aside. And I understand the importance of rituals because it's really good to have rituals, but they don't work for me when it comes to being creative mm -hmm. or, or even any in, in any aspect of my life. It, it, it just happens, so happens that I'm the type of person that my mind is able to think and do things in multiple mm -hmm. settings and multiple dimensions, if that makes any sense to you. No, 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 that makes complete sense to me. And rituals work for a lot of people, but that's why I framed this question in a way, because the creative process can be in both ways. So one is the chaotic. So you have a dozen things around you. Mm -hmm. And you are not actively trying to manage any one of them, but you are still exactly. managing them exactly. by not managing them. Exactly. And then, <laughs> and then there is the other type uh, where I think it's like a yin and yang and different way to uh, pursue creativity. And mm -hmm. I, I was uh, watching a documentary last night uh, and uh, it was on the code and it uh, featured Jackson Pollock, who was a... Okay. Painter. Uh, oh, I'd love to know what his creative process was. <laughs> he, he, there was no process. He used to drink, and then he used to come, and his canvas used to be on the floor, and then he would just throw paint, yeah. and then he's done. And the next uh, evening, he will come back, and he will do that, and then he will do that for a week. And I knew about him, but I never respected his art up until last night when <laughs> I really saw... Because when you, if you just Google image Jackson Pollock uh, yeah, paintings, you will just see uh, paints like they're scattered different. over. Mm -hmm. But you know what is beautiful about that? So, so, so the documentary was on the fractal. So if you, so if you look at Jackson Pollock painting, uh, and he used to paint pretty large, like almost uh, the dimension uh -huh. of a room, so maybe ten by ten, twelve by eight. So if you look at the whole painting, it looks like okay, there's a bunch of uh, different colors of paint thrown right. on the canvas. Then you take a, a two by two or four by four and you take it out and you enlarge it. Yeah. You will think that you're looking at the whole painting. And then if you take another uh, small portion from that's that. So fun. I'm going to tell you why that's so funny, but keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that, so, so there was that fractal thing and it was completely unconscious from right. this side. But this is from our interpretation that it was unconscious because he was drunk and he was just doing uh, like generous in terms of painting <laughs> but no he 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 had understood a right. pattern in the nature so you look at the tree and you look at the forest and the forest is nothing but the tree and then you look at the tree and then the branches is nothing but the tree and then you exactly. look at the branches and the small branches are nothing but the whole uh, image of the tree so 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 coming back to uh, uh, I know you have a point to add but yes so the creative process that you are mentioning I think that is very uh, suitable for a lot of creative people who have I think I think it's about the energy if you have a lot of energy and limited time you just can't let that thing that urge sit in your heart it has to come out exactly. so so you have a book going on you have a website uh, going on but what uh, so, so you said that something is funny about the fractal thing and, and uh, well it's gonna it. go it's gonna go to one, one of your questions so I'll wait till you answer me when you, till you ask the question Probably, hopefully, you'll ask the question. But it has to do with what you just said. Okay, but, okay. Uh, <laughs> let's not wait for that. Uh, t tell, tell me. Uh, I think there is a story, or there is a. Uh, tell me about that. Yeah. Well, it's you know when it came. I also paint, and I it's it's oh. it's very funny. Okay. Because um, I didn't know how to paint. I I never was taught how to paint or anything like that. But one day I decided, oh, I want to I want to paint. I mm -hmm. you know just popped up in my head. I want to learn how to paint. So I watched some YouTube videos and I went out and I got some paints and I got canvases and I started painting. And 
it's like crazy how beautiful the paintings were. So I, one of them in particular, I, I started it and I just felt like it was unfinished. I didn't touch it again. Actually I did. I touched it again a year ago and then I put it back and it just, it just felt unfinished. But that painting, a part of it ended up on the cover of my book. No way. Are you talking about the uh, book cover? Your yes. Book? No way. Yes. Okay, so let me come back to the the original question, which has been on my mind since last night. And let me ask this finally. Okay. So, so first of all, uh, uh, your book cover is beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, so, and, and it's so captivating. There's something about it that, it's just in my my uh, mind. I can just close my eyes and picture you. Oh. So there is a girl or a lady yeah. running. And then there are three bears, two yeah. big ones. One is on the side. And then there yeah. is a red horn horse. Yes, and then a bull. It's a, actually a bull. <laughs> a bull, okay. Yeah. Because, and then there, there's something on the back. So it's, it looks like a mythical uh, creature. Yes. And, and the color is red, so that's interesting. And, and then this this is a countryside. Uh, yes. So and I know the, uh, the the theme of your book is about a journey about transformation. Yeah. So I know that the girl symbolizes that uh, that soul who is about to take this transformational journey. Yes. But my question was this, uh, and there is a lot of questions uh, tied up in this one question. <laughs> so, is there a significance uh, that each of the bear has and the bull has and uh, is it just like uh, running away from the bear or uh, or a group of bear? Or is it like there are three bears? So, so is there any significance be uh, behind the numbers and, and the imagery? Well, well, you know, that is a loaded question. Okay. So first and foremost, um, the, the images that are on the, the painting were actually done. I commissioned an artist to do that. So okay. um, Kat Castleman actually created those images. And it's actually of one bear and two wolves, wolf-like creatures, mm -hmm. and then a bull. And they're actually characters in the story itself. But numbers do play a big part in the story. So that it's interesting that you even said that. Um, Numbers and time are very big in the story because the story itself is not be really based on location. It's based on the narratives of all the characters and the main point of views I within see. the story. Uh -huh. And it's and it ha has a lot to do with the fact that all, all, all of these stories are actually happening at the same time, but in different parallel dimensions and different universes. So okay. every sing so every chapter, there's a, a clumping of different um, locations because my hope was that everyone understood that this is all happening, even if it's in New York or India or Jamaica, wherever. It's all happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. So now the numbers threes and those are try. When you read the book, you'll see that they're tri hours or try. You know, it's a lot of threes or fives. Huh. So. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I was anticipating something because it looked like there's some meaning behind that. Yeah, yeah, it, it is actually. So, you know, my my hope was to to convey, you know, I, I'm not a numerology, numerology person, but I know there's a significance in the number three and also um, in the number five and the number eight. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, people would have to, I guess, kind of do their own research when it comes to that. But, um, the whole point was to show on, on the cover itself, mm -hmm. certain characters in the book and that, yes, they look almost like people, like creatures that could be in our world, but they're from a different world mm -hmm. and a different time. And this, this person, this soul that you said is going on a spiritual journey, who is one of the main characters, uh -huh. is running away from them for a reason, a very important reason, but that's in the story also. Interesting. <laughs> and, and is there a significance behind the... Okay, uh, before I ask you that, um, so you said that this... Uh, I have that book cover right now on my uh, mm -hmm. screen. Uh, I'm not sure if it is it will get recorded, but I hope it gets recorded because it's so beautiful. Thank uh, you. We'll know that <laughs> after this recording. So. Uh, are the colors also signifying something? Uh, one bear, uh, two of the bear is brown, one sort of like 
uh, dark brown or black, and one uh, and the bull is in red. So you know, I I really can't say that in, it was an intention. It's just that that's how I saw it. That's the imaging that I saw in my mind uh -huh. when I wanted it created. Now, as as folks ask me, as I go through different interviews and folks ask me about stuff, uh -huh. I realize that unconsciously there are reasons. Exactly. But, yep. <laughs> at the time that. I was doing it, it wasn't at the forefront of my consciousness, but uncon because this book really, if I told you how this book was written, you wouldn't believe that either. I mean, I really, the intent was to, to, to write a ghost story. That was my intent. Um, and it was going to be based on supernatural events that occurred in an apartment, my first apartment after college, uh -huh. um, real supernatural events that took place. So I was like, okay, I'm going to write this ghost story because it happened to me. I can really talk about it because I experienced it. So it starts out that way. It starts out like in my head trying to, you know, get the stuff on paper, but then it evolves into something completely otherworldly and outside of anything that I had even originally anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, I just got to a point where it, it was almost like it was a story that was channeled through me and I just actually put it on paper. So a lo lot of what's going on in the story, I knew no I didn't organize it. I didn't have an outline. I didn't know what the characters were going to do. I didn't, it wasn't even written in an orderly fashion. There were chapters that were like moved to the back. Some were moved. The first big, the beginning uh -huh. of the first chapter was the last thing that I wrote um, so it, it was, it was really uh, for me, a very mystical process because it was nothing that I'd, I'd ever done before. It was a connection to a force that I am familiar with, but had no idea could actually create this thing that I created. And it's amazing the response that I'm getting from it because it's truly an, an unanticipated event. It really is. Totally. And you made a, such a beautiful point that. Uh, and for anyone who is also a writer listening to this or watching this uh, interview, you can start with a story and you think that you have got it. But yes. as you begin the writing process and you let your soul do the writing, you let your imagination, exactly. your unconscious bring, bring exactly. forward the story, the story might evolve into something very different than what yes. you might have uh, envisioned. So, so that's a yes. very good point uh, you made that. And and uh, I remember, uh, I think it was in your bio or it's on your Amazon author page or somewhere I read. Uh, so it took you about five years to uh, finish this. Uh, yeah, yeah, it took, book. it was about, it took me three, three, it actually, the majority of the book got written in three weeks. It was a, three a weeks? one week, yeah. Wow. A one week vacation over like, three year period, right? So, so wow. every week, every year for one week, I would take my kid and his friends to the Jersey shore. And while they were enjoying everything outside, I would write. And, and a lot of this story got purged during those three weeks. So over three wow. years, the three weeks, and then just the filling in part of it, um, took maybe another year and, you know, the actual uh, finishing of the first draft. So I would say about three and a half, four years, the entire story took. But really, I was not working on it constantly throughout those years. It, it was just every now and then I would actually start, you know, write. Whenever I, whenever I felt the need to write, it, I would write. And, and that, that, that is such a great point that you have made. Uh, the real act of writing doesn't take so long. It's the no. incubation and the idea and the imagination that yeah. is what needs time. So when you write something, let's say five chapters uh, of your book in a week, and then you let it sit and ferment, and yes. let the imagination uh, in, uh, incubate inside your mind and inside your heart, and then you rewrite, and, and it's way faster than trying to write something which yes. is not coming from within your heart, but you're just trying to add words to it. So that that's another uh, 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 great point. Uh, that's so, you're so correct, Salil, because let me tell you, starting the, the book was the hardest part for me. It really was. I, it I is, was it so is caught up in my head. Mm -hmm. I was so caught up in my head and how I really wanted to, you know, what I thought I was going to write that I got overwhelmed. And I, just, I just couldn't think about, well, how am I going to finish it? How am I going to, I know nothing about plots. Like I didn't, take any courses to do this I didn't know how to to I didn't know what I was doing mm -hmm. I really didn't 
but I knew that I had a story that need, for years I've always wanted to write. And so I got caught up. And I think a lot of writers do that. They get caught up in actually the beginning of the book. Like, how do I write it? What am I going to say? How do, do I write in the first person? Do I write in the third person? How am so I going to have all these plots come out? Like, how am I going to make it suspenseful and, and thrilling? And, you know, you get caught up in it. It's like, I tell, I have two people that I'm working with right now. I said, don't forget all about that. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about that. Just write. Just write. Don't delete it. anything. Just mm-hmm. write. And as you get connected to the source that you're really, that stuff really comes from, Mm-hmm. That other stuff goes out the window. You don't even think about that stuff anymore because you get so surprised at the stuff that's coming at you. Like, you know, when you hear the characters talking in your head and what they're saying and, you know, when you get a glimpse of what's going to happen next, it's like, oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Okay. All right. Let me write that down. Oh, that's what you want to say? Okay. You know, that's how it was for me. And I think, so I think true. that's what everyone else, especially if you're a new writer or, you know, you're new to doing this, that's what you really, that's the point that you really need to get to that. You need to overcome getting out of your head, out of the mental process, Mm -hmm. and leave it up to that source that creates stuff out of nothing. Mm -hmm. So true. So, so let me ask you this, Simone. So, you, your, uh, I think your number one advice for uh, writers would be just write, just write. Uh, What if you have to give three uh, advice uh, Mm -hmm. to writers? uh, What would be the other two? Uh, get over your fear of writing. Um, mm-hmm. I think writing in the beginning has a lot to do with fear, fear of how other people are going to perceive what you're writing, fear that, you know, you may not, your book may not be accepted by a publisher, mm-hmm. fear that you may not be able to write in, you know, like the masters that you mm-hmm. read or, you know, the people that you enjoy. It's a lot of fear. So once you can overcome that fear, then it, you can get into the rhythm of writing, right? That would be the first thing. The second thing is do not edit, do not delete, do not reread your stuff. You know, don't get stuck on the first chapter. That's what I did. So mm-hmm. I'm telling everyone, don't do it. Um, don't stay on the, you know, the first thing that you write and keep trying to rewrite it until it's pristine or just, mm-hmm. just so perfect that you're ready to move. Uh, no, the first draft is supposed to be ugly. It's supposed to be horrible. And it's supposed to, you know, you're just supposed to, regurgitate everything that you need to regurgitate on paper and then you go back and you clean it up and you edit it and you try to make sense of what they're saying and make you know take get up the head hopping and all that stuff you do last right Mm -hmm. and then the next thing is to really get a a tough skin Mm -hmm. really and the tough skin post publication or during post publication because people are going to review your work and not everybody's going to like it that's just the that's just the nature of people, and, and, and it not every mean, story is for everyone. So exactly. something might connect to uh, someone, and that story might not connect to other exactly, person. exactly. And and you have to figure out: Are you writing for yourself, or are you writing for the public? Like, are you writing this book because this is something that you have to just get out of you, mm-hmm. or are you writing it because you want to be famous and you know successful? Whatever your whatever your purpose is for doing mm-hmm. this book. The most important thing is that you need to have thick skin because you need to understand that not everyone is going to get what you write. Not everyone is going to agree with what you what you write. Not everyone is going to read what you write, and that's fine. It's completely fine because there are other stories to be told, and your story will serve its purpose for whoever connects to it. Very true, and and during uh, writing of uh, this book, uh, and uh, the book is. Camille and the Bears of Besa Drafnel. Yes. And uh, is Besa Drafnel uh, a place in Jamaica or somewhere? No, Besa is actually, Besa is a place in one of the universe, oh, one of the universes. Okay. Uh-huh. Yes. Within so the, the Bears uh, actually are from Besa. And that's where they, that's their universe. That's what it's called. Okay, and very yes, interesting. Yes, Drafnel is the name of one of the evil characters that's in the book. Okay, so Beza, so the Drafnel of Beza. Yes, okay. yes. Very yes. interesting. So so during uh, during the whole process from uh, uh, the original conception of the idea to publication, what was the hardest uh, uh hardest thing in this book publication process in the book publication process for me the hardest thing was the query letter because you have to put together query um, letter 
and you send it out to agencies and, you know, public publishing houses. And that's what they look at to figure out whether or not they want to take you on board. And sure. so that letter has to be, it has to be pristine. It has to be on point. It has to convey everything that you want it to say to entice this stranger to say, oh, I want to read. Okay, send me three more chapters. I want to read that, you know? And so what I did was I went online and I, I pulled up all the successful query letters mm-hmm. that have actually gotten contracts. That's so you I, just Googled that? How, how did you I find Googled that? I Googled that. Okay. Yes, I Googled that. Um, I Googled query letters and then I, I found, I forget what I found. At that. Also, Writer's Digest helped me a lot. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, that's a great source. Yeah, yeah. And um, on Writer's, I think it was a Writer's Digest that I actually found successful query letters. There was a, an article or something and then it linked to a bunch of, of successful, uh, you know, people who actually got Mm -hmm. contracts from their queries. And so I I read them and I looked at the way that it was formatted, the, you know, what angle they were using, you know, how, how were they conveying whatever it is that they wanted their book to convey? And I use that. And so my query letter, I think I wrote about 50 query letters. Oh my gosh. I kept rewriting. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's the same letter, but I just did Mm -hmm. 50 versions of it. Um, different publishers, I, because yeah. I got a lot of negative, you know, you know, I thank you. It's not, you know, it's not for us at this time. And that's why I say you have to have a thick skin because mm-hmm. you got to be able to get through all those rejection letters, you know, and, and it's going to be a lot of rejections until you just need one person to say yes. Very true. Yeah. You just need one publisher to publish your One book. person. Yeah. You know, so you, that's why you also have to develop a thick skin and you have to be able to understand that, okay, if, if you're getting a lot of rejections from one specific letter, perhaps you need to revise it. Perhaps you need to go back and mm-hmm. address what it is that's not enticing the person that you're trying to entice. And that's what I did until I finally got one publisher to say yes. Very true. And, and uh, what would you say that uh, was in your query letter which... Uh, made it got accepted i mean even though it took rejection which every query letter does yeah but do you think there was something uh, or uh, you wrote it some way or you added a passage or a paragraph or the way you form i mean told your story well you know what i learned is that um, a lot of publishers are looking for your platform if you have a platform interesting and so the the beginning uh you know in the beginning when i first uh sent out the original sets of Mm -hmm. very letters i didn't include my platform my social media platforms um and i noticed that after i did then the rejection letters they they had a different uh a different twist to them it was it wasn't just i was you know rejection it was more you know this sounds good you know, and, and it was just a different response to it. And then um, the more I included in that hmm. particular um, part of the letter, you know, I first I just included maybe the FB. And then I said, okay, let me include Twitter. Let me include every. And so I listed all of my um, mm-hmm. platforms and how and that I would assist it. You know, they're looking to see that you are interested in also assisting in marketing because it's not that you send your query out so you get accepted and then they do all the work you got to do a lot of the work yourself and you have to be you know mm-hmm. open to that and you have to let them know that you're open to assisting in in marketing in whatever aspect possible so that you can get out you can get your name out there mm-hmm. and and when i turned that around when i included that so that was included with also revising the way like i sh- i kind of I, I made it more active. The, the sentences were more active mm-hmm. instead of passive in the query letter. And if, if they're active, then it's just like a book. When you're reading passive, they call it lazy writing. Yes. You, you don't want to keep moving throughout the book. But if it's active, then you get engaged. And so I changed the wording so that it was more active, included the platforms, and then I got a better response. Very nice. Yeah. So that, I think that's another uh, great advice. Uh, thanks for that, Simon. And I think that's a great experience. So next time, and now that you have a book behind yeah. you, and I see that it has got great reviews on Amazon already, yes. and the cover is beautiful. The the uh, the plot sounds very interesting. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have to uh, uh, shamefully admit here <laughs> that I uh, I will order it uh, right after this uh, interview. Oh. 
Thank you for your support. I didn't expect you to, but thank you for your support. The, 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 honestly, it, it should happen that I should have the book already with me. And I wanted to, but I could not because of my own laziness. Aww. But now that uh, knowing more about the plot, and it, it definitely sounds very interesting. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, so let, let's switch uh, gears and uh, talk a little bit about uh, your journey, and then we'll come back to some rapid fire questions. So... Uh, so when did you move to New York and okay. what uh, uh, made you move, leave uh, Jamaica and uh, come to the United States? Okay. Uh, well, I lived in Jamaica until I was 11 years old. Oh, so you're, you're a kid. Yeah, I, I went to high school. You know, it's a different public school. The education system is uh -huh. different down there. So I was actually in my first year of high school. Mm -hmm. And um, my mom, get, she actually... She actually made me make the decision so um, to either go back there or stay here. And as a kid, of course, you want to stay in, you know, as they call it abroad. You want to stay abroad. You want to live abroad. Uh -huh. So um, I said, you know, I, I want to live here. I want to live here with you because my parents had left Jamaica um, at a very young age to make money, to pursue a better education for themselves. Uh -huh. And so they left all their kids. I don't, I don't know where you're from, but. In, I'm from India. Yeah. Okay, from yeah. India. Okay, my grandmother's from India. Wow. So yeah. <laughs> so and and in the story, one of the main characters is a grandmother from India. Oh, so wow. as you can Look see, at all the connections. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so they left. You know, my my mom and dad. They had four kids: myself, two brothers, and a sister. And they left us with my mom's dad. And as kids, you want to be with your parents, right? So. At 11, when she said, well, do you want to go back or do you want to stay here? Of course, I'm going to say, yes, I want to stay with you. So we stayed in in America or the, the U.S., as everyone says now, but it, we stayed here. What was the other part of the question? So so you, you uh, and, and did you come directly to New York or you came? No, actually, when we, uh, here's the other thing. Uh, from the age of 8 to 11, I think it was at 8, we first, uh, maybe it could have been younger. We would come to New York every um, summer and stay with my parents. So um, during the summer, we would stay the whole summer with our parents and then we would go back. And then at 11, we came here permanently. But when we got here permanently, um, we were scooted off to my mom's mother. Mm -hmm. And um, we lived in Chicago for, I believe it was like a, a year and a half. Interesting. And then we came back here. I think, I think my parents um, had, I don't know what, I never asked them actually, and I will ask them now that I'm thinking about it. You know, why did we end up living in Chicago? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know if it was because that you know my mom had me when she was 16, so she was still really young, and maybe they just weren't ready to have a family. A family. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, after the year and a half, we ended up back in New York, and then permanently lived with uh, my parents. Interesting. Do you think? Uh so, so uh, New York is a city, and you mentioned uh, that most of your writing took place when uh, you were on a vacation. Yeah. Uh, was the vacation to a countryside, uh, nature, or to the it? beach? It was. I love the beach. I love nature. I love the beach. And where I live, upstate New York, is very. I'm very. I'm surrounded by nature. Well, you are um, upstate New York, so yeah, that's very yes. beautiful. Uh, yeah, I'm surrounded by nature, but I I find that when I'm close to the water, mm -hmm. it gives me a lot of inspiration too. So, uh -huh. um, I when I I I picked well, I chose. I chose the Jersey Shore for two reasons, because my son, that's where he loved to go when before he graduated from high school, and he and mm -hmm. his friends loved to go there, but also selfishly, because I knew whenever I was closer to the water, mm -hmm. that connection somehow spiritually enabled me to write more. Interesting. And, and let me ask you this. I have never asked this question to anyone, uh, just a curiosity. Uh, do you think from your experience, uh, from a spiritual perspective, uh, the element, the basic element like fire, water, earth, uh, air, uh, and your personality type or your body type, uh, uh, and I'm talking from a creativity perspective, has some impact. So, uh, if you were, so your inspiration came through, I would say, the water element, uh, but yes. let's say if it was fire or air or earth, do you think the element or the surrounding has? Uh, some sort of impact on the direction your story and the character shapes. Oh, definitely. 
Definitely. I, I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. I mean, when I think of fire, you know, fire is usually very cleansing. That's, you know, when you're in the spiritual realm, it's a very cleansing. Um, but it also can be seen as, you know, ferocious or, mm -hmm. you know, um, some, something destructive. Mm -hmm. So um, I think I think definitely dep depending on what my con what my soul connection was to either of those elements it would have been a completely different story. Um, mm -hmm. I think because it was water, it, for me anyway, I felt like it was just a real flowing, free flowing, mm -hmm. just, you know, almost like your floating process. Everything just kind of, when it, when it got to where it was supposed to get, mm -hmm. where, where I connected, it just splurged out. It just, you know, mm -hmm. for me, I think creativity should be free flowing. It should be, there should be no limitations. You shouldn't feel as if you have to do it within a certain time frame. You shouldn't feel as if you're constricted. You should. It's when you when you're stressed or you're thinking about those type of constraints, mm -hmm. it impacts the creativity process. So it should be for me anyway. I, I can't say what it's going to be for you or for anyone else, and I don't want to taint other people's idea of how to create. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe, for me, I firmly believe that it should be free flowing. No one should be, no one should tell you how to do it. You can't get it out of a book. You can't read Very it. True. It can't tell you how it, it's something that you have to experience on your own. And mm -hmm. when you experience it, then you have the evidence to say, ah, oh, yes. this is how it works. And for me, that water walking into the water and just breathing in that fresh, salty sea air mm -hmm. grounded me. It just grounded me and it made me at peace and peaceful and put me in the type of frame of mind that I needed to just have that stuff flow right through me. And it flowed for the whole week. I also wonder, uh, uh, because you did so much of your writing, or at least the influence was because of the ocean. Mm -hmm. And when you are on a beach and you look at the ocean, uh, there is this vast body of uh -huh. water on the horizon. And you see, so it's almost like otherworldly that there is something other than where mm -hmm. you are. So maybe the, the parallel universe and these different worlds. I I'm not sure. I mean, it could be uh, totally unconscious. It could be, I mean, but you know what? Uh, after uh, asking you this, and it just came to my mind that it would be nice if someone can do this research and write a book or an essay that how different elements can shape your yes. book and writing. So maybe uh, pick a couple of authors, maybe a dozen, and wow. find out that someone has done most of, like Stephen King, he writes mostly horror. Yes. But a lot of his writing is done in Maine. And I live in Boston. I've been to Maine uh, several times. He's from Bangor. I've been to Bangor. There's a lot of woods. Uh, there is six months of winter, a lot of snow, uh, not too many people in Bangor. So so I just wonder sometimes that if uh, a theme in his story, because uh, you will see that. And a lot of it is, a lot of his themes are kind of like that, small aren't they? Town, yeah. A few people. Uh, people I love Stephen King. Yeah, people yeah. kind of know each other, but then there is someone who looks good, but there is something evil or sinister yes. going on. And then there is, so I, I just wonder if, if the element earth and the tree and the woods have something to do that uh, versus if someone is doing the writing in an open field with, uh, let's say in Mongolia, I mean, I don't know where, yeah. but it's an open field. So there is a vast sky, blue sky, clear sky. And so you have the uh, uh, the earth and the air let's say so how that would uh, shape that would be a, i think that would be a fantastic essay i think you know it would be a good I, research if someone can if someone listening and uh, is uh, <laughs> has has no idea what to work on i mean this would be something if sounds interesting definitely do, 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 do some research on that like I, i'm uh, again thinking about thoreau uh so walden pond is about maybe um 30 miles from my my home here and i've been there it's a small pond not too big but so being on the pond and it's, it's a lot of woods. So if, if the water and the, uh, again, the woods, uh, and then I'm, yeah. I'm using uh, woods as maybe a semi earth element. Yeah. has something to do with his, uh, curiosity about living free, uh, living on like what the nature is providing and things like how that. But anyways, not, totally off topic. Do you not look <laughs> at a tree and wonder about life. I mean, trees to me are amazing things of, of life. I mean, when I walk around and I look at a tree and, you know, the, the height of the tree, the fact that it can sprout these branches and, you know, it stays rooted and it just, it's just such a miracle to me. I, I but 
that's a whole other story. But that's a I, get, I completely get that, you know? Absolutely. And we may have to do a conversation number two to just because it just my mind is flooded with new ideas. So now now I'm thinking if you look at the different Buddhist uh, tradition. Yes. So the Theravada from uh, Thailand and places uh, which has a lot of uh, nature versus Tibetan Buddhism where or even in India or in Himalayan area in Nepal, uh, a lot of their monasteries would be in mountain uh, mm. with no trees. Uh, yes. It's a dry area. And their uh, take on spirituality and life is very ascetic. Like they, yes. they, they think the world and the spiritual life is somewhat. Uh, uh, I very don't want isolated. to use the word separate and isolated. It uh, is, but but it is. Uh, but it is uh, it, you definitely get that, get that sense from being an outsider. Yeah. Versus a lot of spiritual uh, retreat. If you look in the West, especially in California, uh, in in the East Coast here, uh, they would be. Uh, with a lot of nature so so a, a lot of spiritual retreats uh, here uh, be it meditation be it yoga be it mm -hmm. any spiritual uh, path they are uh, built on a mountain but with lots of greenery and yes. woods and their take on life is uh, that you integrate and you have this yoga you have this meditation but then that is to purify that is to keep your ego and self detached yeah. from your original uh, or the true self. So I'm just wondering that if the nature and the environment, and I, 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 now I'm pretty sure that it definitely impacts oh, of your your environment, how you even. So so maybe even if you look at the desert fathers and mothers uh, in early Christianity, uh, in an area where you have nothing, no water, no food, and desert, uh, their take on purity versus if you look at the uh, Catholics from Italy versus if you look at the Orthodox Church uh, and and you know so I I can totally see you can have the same yeah. scripture same message but your environment can totally shape your uh, interpretation uh, definitely of the message. and well, it may happen with the book and the author but anyway I, I mean I, <laughs> that's I, a whole nother conversation <laughs> and I should be asking you these questions <laughs> but but my mind is just. Uh, uh, exploding with these uh, these great ideas. I think this is one thing that happens when you talk to other creative people. Uh, you stumble upon thoughts, yeah, which might be on the back burner, but you kind of just take a have a glimpse of it, and then you think. But anyways, uh, we'll get lost into this. <laughs> I appreciate your mind. I appreciate how your mind works. So I get it. <laughs> I, I think I'm I'm kind of doing the clustering. Uh, clustering is a idea uh, popularized by Gabriel Rico. He is a uh, she had a very popular book on, I think, on writing the natural way. Or she, she's a oh. professor at uh, San Jose uh, State University. But anyways, so I think it, it was the clustering, active act of clustering. <laughs> but anyways, uh, since we are on the topic of book and uh, um, uh, resources and uh, uh, tips for writers, and also for us or someone who has written maybe a dozen book, uh, doesn't matter because the, each creative project is a new beginning a new start uh, in itself yeah. what are your uh, top three top five go-to books on creativity and you can also expand it uh, leadership uh, mm. management family spirituality but but let's begin with uh, I would say uh, writing and creativity wow um, and I, you can I, take your time because I will I'll just <laughs> take a note yeah <laughs> As far as writing and creativity, um, hmm, I really cannot admit to a, a source because, as I said, um, my source was my intimate connection with source energy itself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have bought books on how to write. Um, they don't. They didn't help me at all, mm -hmm. and so I, I really cannot. I, there is no one book in particular that I can say you could, you know, that would be the book that I, I would go to for creativity. No, there there really isn't. I think mm -hmm. creativity, like I said, is an individual process. It is something that you tap into. It is something that you personally have to tap into with that source that creates nothing, something out of nothing mm -hmm. all the time. It, it's the same. It's the same source that created the bridges that cars drive over or mm -hmm. you know the same source that now people are wondering about quantum physics and you know oh it's the same source that you know there are atoms you know that they're proton protons but you can't see them but they're exactly. there right so it's it's that source that you connect to 
So there's nothing that I can say. There's no one book or no one source that I could say here, you know, definitely check this out. It's going to help you. That's something that you're going to have to tap into on an individual level. And it could be sometimes misleading also when people say that uh, if you read this book, you will become creative or you will become a great writer. Exactly. And in truth, there is no such uh, thing. No. Yeah. yeah. No. It's, it's 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 like you know the Bible you know and I, I don't I don't want to bring up religion or anything I'm not a religious person but I was I went I, listen I grew up in the church mm -hmm. so I know from whence religion is come, comes and how you have to aspire but I it's not something that I am into mm -hmm. um, but it's the same thing as people interpreting the Bible right mm -hmm. it's 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 an individual interpretation I can read the Very Bible true. and see something that you don't see. And so, you know, you go to church and the minister is interpreting it his way and telling you this is the way. No, 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 no. It's your, it, go read it yourself, figure out what it's saying for you and you, you use it that way. You know, Very true. it's just a form of control as far as I'm concerned. Um, as far as other books that I think um, I really, I like Think and Grow Rich. Mm -hmm. Napoleon Hill. Yeah. Napoleon Hill. Yes, that's, you know, I, I read that. Um, a friend of mine introduced me to that book years ago. And the first time I read it, I didn't really get it. But then um, as I started on my creative process and I read it multiple times, mm -hmm. now I get it. You know, now, now that I know that something exists outside of me that a lot of people don't understand, mm -hmm. I get it. I completely get where he was coming from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that would be one of my main I, I books. love that book. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And my, my son is actually reading it now. The E-Myth. Revisited, and I can't remember the name of the author right now. It's a great book if you are entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. and um, it's really about um, the different types of uh, business personalities. So you can have someone who is an entrepreneur, a pure entrepreneur, mm -hmm. or you can have someone who um, is a technical person mm -hmm. who wants to be an entrepreneur, but they don't understand that they mm -hmm. have to not. They can't work in the business. They have to work on the business. You know, that's the whole thing. Oh, yeah. I'll have to check it and out. It, it teaches you how to work on your business and not in your business if you want to be a true entrepreneur. So, so uh, tell me, what is the uh, difference uh, between working on the business versus working so, in your business? Here's the thing. I can, let's say I have a business mm -hmm. and um, I can make the choice of, if I go out and get an account, mm -hmm. I place myself in the account and I work at the account. Or okay. I can hire people uh -huh. and, and oh, put see. them in the account uh -huh. so I can go out and get more accounts, right? And so you have a lot of people who are self, um, self-owned, you know, they have their own uh -huh. business. And um, because they, they stay limited because they're actually doing the work as opposed to hiring people who have the expertise that's needed and placing them to do it. Like, you know, instead of me creating my website, I could have hired someone to create the website. Right. And because they have that set of expertise or skills that they can, and they can devote all their time to it. So I can devote my time to painting or writing. Uh -huh. Right. It's the same concept. A lot of people sit in their business. They want to, you know, they want to start a business, but they don't know how to remove themselves from the business. They they're working in the business as opposed to working on the business. Very good. Yeah, I, I really like that. And it makes sense. Yeah. My son actually introduced me to this book. And I was so glad that I read it. And Oprah actually had it on her show. Wow. After I read it. And I think he, she interviewed uh, Paolo Cello, I think his name is. The Alchemist. Oh, Paolo Coelho. The Quino. Alchemist. The uh, Paolo Coelho. Yeah, I, I yes. love this book. Yeah, The Alchemist. I, I, I think I read The Alchemist. Uh, in my college years, almost maybe 10 years ago, maybe really? uh, longer than that. And Alchemist was, I think, my first book, uh, fiction work, which I finished, I think, in two sittings. I did uh -huh. not read cover to cover in one sitting, but I did finish it in two sittings. It was so captivating. I, think I did so. Also. And I just wanted to yeah, read and find out. out. Yeah, you, yeah. you want to know what's going to, how is this going to end? Like, what's, where is this going? You it's know? a beautiful book. It's a beautiful but it's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful story about a journey and yes. um, a, a spiritual journey, really. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it's, it's like any other story. You know, the, the person gets caught up in, you know, which direction do I take? Who, uh -huh. You know, where do I go from here? And why is this happening to me? 
Um, but I, I love The Alchemist. And my, my 18 year old is the one, he, when he was 17, he asked me, he said, oh, I want to read that book, The Alchemist. I'm like, what is The Alchemist? Never heard it before. And he, I got it for him and he said it was so good. I'm like, okay, I'm going to read it since you think it's so good. And I did, and I really enjoyed it. So I, I would definitely, you know, tell Great people, books. Yep. go read that book. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, another book. And this, of course, you know, a lot of people may not get it, but Hiring the Angels. Oh, I um, that's by Gene Slater, S-L-A-T-T-E-R. And Gene was on my um, my Miracle Mind Fest seminars. And... Um, she has this great book about asking the angels for assistance and it actually works. And so, so the angels here is not like angel like worker, but it is hiring no. the angels. So angel, angel, angels, angels, Ooh, angels. You just ask for help. You ask for help and it actually does work. And I ask my angels for help all the time uh -huh. now that I've learned. And, and actually I had been doing it all my life, but I didn't realize that it, that's what I was really doing, you know, like I would, and I think a lot of people do like you, before uh -huh. you do something major, you might say, Oh Lord, please, you know, help me. Yeah. You know, it, it's the same thing. You're asking for help from, from a force that you may not believe actually exists, exactly. but, but you know what? After my connections with the different things that have occurred in my life, I can truly tell you that they do exist. They do. And so that's a great book. Um, I think everyone should read it because it really tells you, you can, and you ask for assistance for every, I ask for assistance for every, everything that I do, everything. When I, before I got on the call with you, I, I reached out and I said, please, I want you to be with me. I want you to guide me. I want you to talk, you know, speak through me so that I'm poised, I'm articulate and you know, all the mm -hmm. things that I want. And so they're helping me right now. And that's what you do. You ask for assistance at all times. Wow. So what is the genre of this book? Is it nonfiction, self-help? I think it would be spiritual self-help, self probably. Spiritual self-help? Yeah. yeah. Very good. While we're talking about hiring the angels, uh, and I know it's not uh, directly related, but I remember earlier uh, you mentioned about something that happened in your college year. Uh, okay. Which is linked to also your uh, book and the story. Do you mind uh, telling what exactly happened and how did that shape your journey? Yeah, so... <laughs> and when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> People are going to think I'm crazy. Okay, all right. Um, no, so I, when I graduate... <laughs> I don't think you're crazy. And I think uh, a lot of people will relate to that. And in fact, those who have a similar story and they have not spoken it out, they have not shared it, or they have maybe even started to doubt it that yeah. oh, something happened to me 10 years ago but i don't know if that was just a dream or, or real you know as time goes on so i think uh, it would be great i mean okay. <laughs> first of all i want to acknowledge you for honoring your experience and trusting yeah. that because a lot of times we have a deep experience uh, and then as time goes by we sort of start to self-doubt that ah, 10 years ago something very uh, tragic happened and I was in that s uh, state of being where I was so uh, awakened and enlightened but I don't know if that was just psychological or mental or I don't know because I don't I can't recreate that state right you know what, what I mean yeah it happens with a I lot of people you I, used I to meditate now you it. left and now you're like oh, I don't know if that was real or if that was just a psychological you know yes yes I, I get it. I, I completely understand. Um, okay, so here's what happened. I graduated from college, moved into this beautiful brownstone um, mm -hmm. apartment in Brooklyn. And, um, <laughs> oh my Brooklyn. God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the book actually starts out with this story, but okay. I, as I said, it changes. So I moved into this apartment and I start hearing like kids running up and down, you know, in the house and there are no kids in the house, There's no kids in any of the other apartments. I constantly hear this woman doing the musical scales over and over. She's just singing, do re mi fa so la, over and over at all times of the day. I'm Someone like, in, in the apartment above uh, upstairs? No, it was no one. No one else could hear this but me. Oh. I would. I said to my roommates, do you hear that? And they were like, no, what are you talking about? I was like, you don't hear that woman singing the thing over and over. No, they don't hear it. So all these little things would happen, you know, things would go missing, um, crazy stuff. So what really, where it really culminates is 
one day it was raining hard outside. My roommates were at work or they were, I may, may have been out, but it was pouring outside and I was in my room and I'm, I'm in my room and I hear footsteps going up and down. It was a duplex apartment. So we had stairs inside the apartment mm -hmm. and I would hear like people running up and down these stairs. And I'm like, who's in the apartment? I'm here by myself. Oh my God, I'm being robbed. Something's going on. You know, I'm panicked. I'm panicked. Right. And after a while, what happened was I ended up calling the police. Wow. And I said, listen, someone's, I'm whispering on the phone. Someone's in my apartment. I'm so free, afraid. I need you to get over here right away. They come, knock down the door. Wow. <laughs> so embarrassed. No one's there. No one's wow. in my apartment but me, right? What did but you tell them then? I mean, what? <laughs> What I don't remember what you? I said. I said, you have to, I think I was, might have said, you have to believe me. I heard some, I heard stuff going on in here. Like I could actually hear people talking and walking up and down the stairs and, and having conversations. Like it was like crazy. And I trust, I'm not a crazy person. I want everyone to know that I'm not crazy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then another thing that happened was, and this is in the story too, I was actually standing downstairs in the kitchen and there were, we had this huge, these huge bay windows. And I, my, my, uh, no, I thought when I saw the person, I saw this person, the ref, uh, like a reflection of a woman in the, in the glass of the window in the panes of the window. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, I turn around to see if it was, if it was one of my roommates. Cause I'm like, who is this woman? And she's dressed in all white. So I turn, I'm like, no one's behind me. So I yell up for my roommate. I'm like, Tracy, Tracy, are you here? And no one answers. No one's in the house again. But this thing is in the window, floating and looking at me. And I just ran upstairs. So it's like stuff like that was happening throughout, you know. And, and wow. you know, now I understand, you know, that I just, I'm able to connect to wow. to that other side. And, and I, I am able to, to, you know, speak with people who have passed over and stuff like that. So, But then I didn't know that. I just thought, you know, what the heck is going on? There are ghosts living in here. Wow. That's a powerful <laughs> uh, experience. And I think... Uh, it is also uh, so. Did, did that thing stopped happening after that uh, when you called police, or it still? Uh, oh no, it still went on. Um, I went ended on. up moving out of the apartment. Okay. Um, you know, and and of course, I you know was hoping that it didn't follow me wherever I went. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I had several different things happen as far as supernatural things um, happening. But again, it it and then I didn't understand it. I just thought. It was ghosts, whatever, and, and, and it probably was. I don't know. But I know that I'm, I have the ability. I, I went to a psychic school, and I, I do have the ability to connect with people on the other side, or even psychically I can connect to people. I can, I can also um, do remote viewing. So I can actually go, and if you're in another country, I can actually go there and see what it is that you're doing. So it's just different things that I, different abilities that I have that I did not know that I had at the time, but I have since then developed and you know mm -hmm. tried to practice and use more often because the more you use it the the more um the stronger it gets yeah very true and uh i know we are coming uh close to our time but i have so many questions that are related to those uh, incident but i would leave that uh for the readers uh to find out more in your book and we will definitely have to do round two <laughs> um so let, let, there are two more questions. Uh, uh, what is next for you? Now that this book is out, uh, I know you may be busy for the next couple of months marketing uh, with the book promotion, but any other uh, projects going on? Oh, yeah, I'm working on the next book in the series. It's, you know, this, is, this was the first book in the series. There are going to be three. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm working on the next book in the series. I haven't had time to really devote to it. Like you said, I'm marketing and trying to get everything, you know, the word out there with the book. Um, and and I, I have started it, the second book, and the first chapter is very violent, and I don't know where it's coming from. And again, I don't know these things until I start writing it, and then everything flows. So, um, But it's going to be an interesting book. Um, and I'm also working on another book, which would be nonfiction, and that will be based on my, my spiritual journey and, you know, my ability to... Um, to psychically connect with people. So that's going to be um, nonfiction. Very good. Any any plans when you might... Uh, uh, I'm hoping that they'll be done, you know, within the next six to 12 months. I'm, I'm trying to get them done as quickly as possible. Um, I'm not going to wait for the vacations to, to mm -hmm. write. You know, I'm going to 
find the time to write, hopefully. Um, and hopefully, you know, um, my book has been, it looks like it's selling pretty well. So I'll be able to leave corporate America pretty soon and, and just be able to devote full time. To write. I totally trust that. And uh, given your uh, passion, and I think a lot of time it's about finding your inner passion oh, and trusting yeah. the journey. And yeah. you have already taken your uh, multiple steps, not just the first step, but you are already on this journey. Yeah. So, so that's true. And uh, yeah, I would be, after I finish your uh, book, one of the series, I will be definitely waiting for it to come. <laughs> Thank you. By latest next year. <laughs> Instead of sometimes, you know, some authors they have a book in series and they have book one out and then it takes three yes. years for book two to come out. Yeah. So, so definitely, I think uh, next year would be uh, great. But again, uh, creativity, uh, it's hard to. Uh, yeah, you force can't put time limit on there. Yeah. Yes. You know, when, when it comes, it'll, it'll come. <laughs> but that's my intention. And uh, my last, last question is, uh, where can our listeners uh, find you? I will add, uh, I have all your links, which I will okay. add to the show notes. And even on YouTube, I, in the description, I will add that. Uh, it's Perfect. right in the description uh, on my blog. It will be uh, uh, with the episode. But uh, uh, for people, those who are listening, uh, what, what is the, the best way to uh, connect with you and people to find you? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, the best way to find me, of course, would be on my website, um, ssalmonauthor.com. Mm -hmm. um, and you can connect with me on Twitter. I have a, a great community on Twitter. And um, my handle is at Miracle Mind Coach without the H on the end. Mm -hmm. um, but those are, I would say, the primary ways to get in contact with me. Well, great. Uh, definitely. And I'm connected uh, with you. On I just followed you on Instagram today morning. Oh, perfect. <laughs> I, Thank you. I found that. And I, I really uh, liked your uh, uh, Instagram ga gallery. Very uh, aesthetic, I would say. It's, it's not as big as others yet, but I'm working. Even That's the last thing. That's the last platform that I've actually uh -huh. connected to. So I'm going to do my best to try to build that up right now. So we'll see what happens. But thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I had uh, really a blast. I really enjoyed hearing your too. stories. <laughs> I've had a wonderful time. You've, ha you've yeah. asked, I think, the most relevant of questions. And, mm -hmm. and I think that this was quite engaging. I had fun. I loved talking with you. Thank you so much for allowing me to be myself and to to say the things that are on my spirit and within my heart. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And until then, I will be reading your tweets. And now I have your Instagram, so I'll be commenting and checking on that. Perfect, perfect. And I'll, I'll connect with you on, I think I connected to you on several, but I'll make sure I connect uh -huh. on every of them. Yeah. Well, I will look forward to that. And you have a great rest of the day. It's a beautiful weather out uh, today. So Thank you. You too. Can't wait for the next time. And signing off right now. Same and here. Bye so much. Bye-bye.